Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Oahu, where weekly I interview some of the world's most inspiring people from business, philanthropy, and entertainment. I love collecting humans, and these are some of my favorites I've found along the way. This podcast is brought to us by Capita Financial Network. Do you need help with the next steps of your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, state attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call or schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. Hello, and welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. Today, I'm very excited to introduce a dear friend of mine, Rob McMillan, and he is someone that I met through my friend, Matt. Hi, Rob. Thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> this is going to be fun. I love your background with all this fish. So Rob is, by the way, a killer fisherman, so I hear. So so pictures seem to indicate with all of the prize. I actually, I hate this. I hate this, fish, Lindsay. I like to I like to catch fish. There's a difference. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. And you, yeah, you often have a picture with a very large caught fish, whether in the ocean or on the river. Um, and Rob was introduced to me by our mutual friend that we both love and respect, Matt Peterson. And Rob uh, met Matt in the world of 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 um, venture capital, investing, entrepreneurship. I mean, you've got an incredible background. We're actually best friends and frenemies in business school. And <laughs> much start, we're talk about started that. In, Yeah. So Go that's for actually it. Tell me the frenemy matter. story of Matt. <laughs> so we, um, I was at the end of four years of grad school and I was bored and, and being a jerk and he would call me on it. I think that's the main gist of it. Um, but he <laughs> was really smart guy that I, um, that I respected a ton. And uh, we've turned our business school friendship into a professional friendship and worked on a number of projects together. And I have not become independently wealthy like five times by not doing what he told me to do. <laughs> he, he is such a gift. This is fun that we're having a mutual like peek out session about Matt for a second, because I think there's something really powerful about honoring, honoring when friends share their friends with each other, you know? Um, because I'm so grateful to him for introducing us and he's introduced some incredible people to me, but his, um, I, I think the thing that I love most about him is he's so smart, but he's so humble and it's not like a false, it's not like a false modesty. Like he actually genuinely yeah. is just deeply, deeply humble. And I want that to rub off on me so bad. And I want, he's not self-focused. He's so incredibly authentic and oh my gosh, is he talented? He's so unbelievably unaware of just how talented he is. So Rob, I'm excited uh, to talk a little bit about everything that you're working on. And I've had the great pleasure of being an advisor to you in capacity of Angel Venture Capital Fund. We're going to talk a little about that today. But why don't we start and back up a little bit and talk about your story? What got you into venture capital? I love that you've taken the tools of business and investing and the private sector into the the developed world to help people living in extreme poverty and the way you've disrupted and um, had tremendous success in that space is a story that's totally worth hearing. Um, why don't you share a little bit about your story, whatever you want to start with. Like, you know, you can start with your grandparents, you can start with, you know, your LDS mission, wherever you want to go. Go go to the beginnings of yeah. time. Yeah, I grew up in an uh, in agricultural community in Twin Falls, Idaho, um, Very in, cool. a, in a middle class family. Um, and, uh, my dad found Jesus early on when we did a little, uh, little move to Colorado for a couple of years and that really saved our family. So that was awesome. Uh, and my dad, uh, was a really smart guy, entrepreneur, never had a chance to go to college. And he's, you know, he kind of looked all me and my siblings and said, you're going to college and, uh, you know, you're gonna you're do doing more it. things. And, uh, yeah, so huge, uh, I, I definitely stand on the shoulders of my parents. They're amazing, Bob and Celeste McMillan. So, um, and uh, came out of there. I had no business getting it. I didn't even know what venture capital was. All the people we looked up to in my hometown were 
doctors and lawyers in the small agricultural town, which is and uh, kind of crazy. The, I'm sure we'll talk about the Harmon brothers a little bit, but they grew up 30 minutes um, down the road in Burley, Idaho, um, and uh, and I was in Twin Falls, and you know, as as uh, as potato farmers. So, yep, just uh, agricultural kid wrestled, played football, um, and uh, at a you know at a at a, at a decent level. Um, and, uh, did really well academically as well and went to end up going to Utah state on the leadership scholarship, uh, served a mission in Venezuela. And between those two experiences, I kind of, um, kind of, uh, found my life mission, which is to, you know, to work and impact. And, uh, I used to stay awake in the MTC before I got to Venezuela, dreaming about going back to Venezuela to do business. And I had just taken macro econ at Utah State and learned about capitalism's ability to help pull people out of poverty. And uh, yeah, so that's that's how that happened. Um, came home, finished up at Utah State, was a Senate staffer for a year, uh, went to BYU, uh, did a, one year uh, for law school, and uh, did one year and was like, oh my word, I'd never practiced law. Jumped in the MBA program and I got an internship at what was at the time the largest venture capital firm kind of in the, in the Northwest, vSpring Capital in Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, had no prospects of getting hired. Um, and I got put on a fundraising Europe team um, and I just... I hustled hard i ended up sleeping at the fund uh the you know overnight as i was calling into europe um and i, I didn't know any better and uh and it it by the, the the managing partner was like you just got more fundraising appointments for me than all of our placement agents across 400 million dollars of capital have gotten me and uh, so that impressed him and he hired me as a venture wow. capital analyst even though I just as a middle class farm, you know, our agricultural kid um, that uh, did, didn't didn't go to a Ivy League school. So that that was my. That's how I got into venture capital. What's some hustle? I love, I love it. Yeah. And uh, you know, I heard something earlier that like hit me, um, Rob. That I, I hope you don't mind. This is a little bit of a, a pivot, but you talked about your parents with a lot of gratitude, and being yeah. somebody we share. We share the same um, faith background, at least, you know, being LDS and then both like big fans of Jesus and, you know, the scriptures that we follow or whatever, talk about like honoring your mother and father. And as I've, as I've gone on my healing journey as an adult and becoming an adult, there's so much beauty in holding our parents in their totality, being honest about their, their humanity, their fallibility their you know shortcomings how they hurt us how they messed up all the trauma whatever and unbelievable gratitude and love for who they are and the gifts they've given us both painful and beautiful and, and powerful and um i just heard that you just have a deferential energy towards your parents that you just let out with that really like excited me and made me smile can you talk a little bit about that like have you always been close yeah. to your parents? Have you gone on a journey with them? Are you still in the journey? Like yeah, maybe yeah, was like, Here's a little more detail. Like <clears throat> they were um, 16 and 17 when they got pregnant with me in high school and, uh, and got married. Mom ended up having two children before she graduated high school. Kind of crazy. Um, and they always said that I was the uh, third adult that was born. Um, I've <laughs> seen that a lot friends and family kind of this feeling of um man my parents have hurt me and they've been great in this mixed bag i don't feel a lot of that um for my parents i just feel gratitude. like i feel like i there i know i feel like the reason i don't really hold anything against my parents but one they were amazing um yeah. but two like anything that was imperfect like i don't i don't really see I, I see those same in, most of those same imperfections in myself, so I don't really, uh, I don't really feel like I, yeah, I just don't judge them for that, I guess. And and it hasn't, I don't yeah. have a lot of pain or 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 trauma from from uh, the way they raised me. It was it, they raised me with a kind of a blue collar work ethic and uh, and 
Um, I've never wanted anything. I'm going to, I'm going to cry. I cry really easy. Um, it's okay. you know, they've never wanted anything than the very best for me. Um, no. they wanted me to, to, to go much farther than they ever had a chance to. So, um, oh, yeah, no. so they're amazing. people. So I love it. Happens. Yeah. Your gratitude shows. And by the way, I, 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 don't ever cry, don't ever apologize for crying. Not that you were, but you're kind of like you actually didn't apologize. I should say, but a lot of people do. They're like, "I'm sorry, I'm going to cry" or whatever. Um, to me, it's just love pouring out of people's eyes. It's the coolest. So, especially when yeah. men, nothing more endearing. I, uh, there was, yeah. you know, I uh, all they'll they'll be like a used car lot grand opening, you know, and I'll go <laughs> to that and cry. So, of course, that with all that gratitude and love in your heart, it's like so raw and uh, at the surface. Um, my kids look look for me in movies um, when, like, in any Disney movie or whatever, when there's an emotional moment. Like, especially if the cartoon character starts crying, I just start crying. I have, like, this allergic totally. response to crying in the sense that it automatically causes me and triggers <laughs> me. Anybody, everything, commercials, it doesn't matter, yeah. you know? And so they always look at me because they know. And so it's kind of like, mom's going to be crying. <laughs> I get embarrassed. Now I just embrace them like, yeah, this is me doing me. <laughs> Um, Abby is very much not a crier, so it's pretty funny. And she's, but she's way more, uh, you know, she's really nice and sensitive and feminine, but crying is not a thing she does very much. So it's kind of funny. And I try to be this tough, you know, redneck dude with small man syndrome and always be tough, but I'm always crying. So it's, it's a, it's funny. That's amazing. Abby's your beautiful wife and you guys have five kids. Yeah. Five and kids, four daughters and a son at the end such a baller um rob i um i'm just such a fan of yours the way you love people you're you've been a very good friend to me in business um you've said things to me that were maybe hard and scary to say to help beckon me to betterment and give me direction and they were for me and you are encouraging and you're authentic and you love people well and you're brave in, in your truth. And I just I just find you so infectious and I just, I'm so glad I get to be your friend. So why don't we start with talking a little bit about um, this, this world of taking the private sector and venture capital into develop, the developed world and helping people get out of poverty. And love for you to share a little bit about that journey. It's, so, it's a fascinating disruption and really exciting. And there's so much opportunity. It's like the wild west, I feel like, in today's world so much opportunity um and, and maybe share what you've done and what you're looking to do and what why it excites you well thanks for your kind compliments first i i'm really grateful for our friendship as well and and uh and i'm, I'm glad we we're true friends that have been able to help each other along the way so um the uh so being making impact in all of this is is uh is so important to me I've, you know, I, uh, I definitely have not prioritized, um, money, but rather the things that I thought would be most impactful and the, the money has come along the way, uh, thankfully. So that's, that's been, I've been really blessed, um, to be able to have both have my, have my cake and, and eat it too. You know, my two kind of core professional missions right now, um, are to, uh, you know, take on Hollywood, um, and uh, that's a good description of what I do at my day job. And then the other one is um, help as many people get into the middle class as possible. So those are my those are my two missions. So um, on the emerging market side of things, as I as I mentioned, you know, I I would stay awake. Uh, did I mention that in the MTC? Yeah, before I even got to Venezuela, dreaming about going back. So did my mission. Loved it. Loved the Venezuelan people. They are. The, if you get the chance to know Venezuelans, they're just like the most laid back, party oriented, fun people ever, which was super fun for my personality. I was, I did, I, I felt um, many times that I was much more Venezuelan than American for sure. But, um, and uh, that was super fun. So I always dreamed of getting back to Latin America. And uh, I, uh, I got this dream job in Salt Lake City, Utah, you know, and being uh, from Idaho, we, we always look down on people from Utah. And I asked, kind of ask the Lord why the heck I'd be in Utah if I'd be willing to go anywhere in the world. And, uh, and three months into my job there, my mentor, Paul Ostrom asked me if I wanted to help launch the venture capital industry in Mexico. And I was like, 
yes, I would. So Paul was influential in helping get venture going in Utah um, and was invited by the country of Mexico to do that. So um, that was that was awesome. Uh, we worked on that project for about 18 months, kind of putting the foundation in place and getting that fund ready. And Paul moved to Mexico. I um, was signing my real estate contract when I got the strong impression not to move to Mexico. And I was like, what? Why would I not move to Mexico? <laughs> um, and this is, I've been working on this for 18 months. This is my dream. This is my, you know, my boss is going to be so disappointed in me. It was super rough. And, uh, but I had, I had ignored a, a strong impression like that before to me and many other people's uh, pain, strong pain. It's <laughs> wasn't about to ignore that again so anyway i came back didn't go to mexico initially actually never made it to mexico um we'll get into that in a second and i came back and i joined one of the startups we had funded as the first investor as the first executive um and and was in charge of running sales uh grew sales really well the first year we 10 x it was doing really well the second year and motorola bought us and i got an early exit um, made my first good chunk of money and, uh, and the fund took way longer to get going than anybody thought. Uh, turns out a narco war broke out in Mexico kind of the, right at that time. So I got an exit, was wow. able to go do the fund and never, never miss, didn't miss a beat, helped distribute that whole fund was the, was kind of the lead most senior professional in that fund. Um, and, uh, which was, which was awesome. So and out the venture. So we, we managed 69 million. We were headquartered in Monterey, Mexico. We invested up and down the Americas, including the U S and we seeded three unicorns and invested in another growth unicorn. So it was a wildly successful fund. Um, and, uh, just kind of a huge, huge blessing and lesson for me, you know, follow those impressions. Um, the Lord's got a better plan for us than we do for sure. Um, and you know, I, I got an exit, got to do the fund, got, again, got a chance to have my cake and, and, uh, and eat it too. It's kind of the story of my life. I, I, uh, so been so blessed, um, up to this point of, uh, of just, you know, lots of opportunities I didn't necessarily, uh, deserve or, or see coming. So been, been fun. Um, so after that first exit, I kind of looked at all the local NGOs, um, and uh, and I realized most of them are, are wildly underfunded and they're just kind of big fundraising organizations. There was one that I really admired and still admire to this day. It's called Fundet Fundval. Nobody's heard of it. It's just um, it's just funded by its by its founder, David Clark. And he goes out and negotiates with large multinationals and asks them what they need dozens of. And an example of, of something he's identified is uh, heating and air conditioning techs, and he'll negotiate training for that position. Um, and then he gets these, um, he, he's focused on the LDS community. He gets return missionaries, these jobs, uh, like 2,000 return missionaries a year. And wow. such a cool NGO. So awesome. Um, That's amazing. As, yeah, as Out the Ventures went along, we got invited uh to to launch the venture industry in peru so abby and me and the girls headed to peru to head that project up um we we had a contract with the, the peruvian development bank called cofide um and i got to serve down there and and in the one of the main headquarters for fundet funval was down there and i saw these kids that were that were getting these opportunities and they fundet funval was taking them from 100 dollars a month in income to 300 dollars a month in income which was well, for those those young kids that was amazing right that was uh triple your income that's always a good thing um but 300 dollars a month does not put you in the middle class in in lima so in lima to be in the middle class to have a spouse a couple of kids a small apartment in a small car which is kind of what i would consider to be you know like lower middle class and and you're you know you don't have food insecurity so you never never during the month are you gonna have to miss meals um, you need six bucks an hour or a thousand dollars a month. Well, and so um, that became my mantra, and that's kind of my my goal. And uh, so I've had um, 
that's that's really what I want to do is help as many people as I can kind of in the emerging markets get get into um, six dollar an hour jobs. We've done that through our startups. Um, we've done that through um, uh, a staffing agency, and uh, and it, we help folks uh, get into the middle class. So um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's kind of the um, using business to help help people. So my my two missions again. Uh, you know, take on Hollywood and help it, help it amplify, help it have more light and uh, help as many folks as I can kind of get into the middle class. So I don't know and if I, that answers your question. That was Long brilliant. Answer. Um, I love it. And I, I'm excited to get into that. You're taking on Hollywood statement and what that means. And I'm thrilled to be a part of that with you in some degree, but um, I, I'd love to ask you this question. Can We've talked a little bit about actually, before, yeah. before we transition, yeah, can I add one important thing? Yeah. So Please, yeah. one of the core inspirations I've had around helping people get in the middle class is the book Prosperity Paradox. It's written by Clayton Christensen, which many of us um, really look up to. Uh, it was his last book before he passed away. Many people don't even know he wrote it, but he applied his ideas to uh, in, his, in a lot of his core fundamental theories to how to develop countries. It's a very compelling book. Um, and, um, it if anybody's interested in how I plan to accelerate my efforts to bring people in the middle class, that, that book is kind of my, um, kind of my blueprint. And I, you know, I anticipate getting back on, on the ground in Latin America and other emerging markets to, to do, uh, to buy and, and help build large, large companies. So anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's a core no. piece of the story. I wanted to sh give credit to one of my distant heroes that i i shook his hand once but didn't really know clayton christensen i love it um and thank you for that this is actually a great segue into what i was going to ask which is talking about heroes and mentors and people we look up to and people that are pointing us giving us a roadmap for our lives um leading us to love ourselves and the world better you we've talked a little bit about your love for paul Sherman. and i've had a chance to meet him he's absolutely brilliant um very strong man so rob I've had a chance to meet one of your mentors, um, uh, Paul Alstrom, who I know you love and adore. And you talk and Clayton Christensen, someone I've also admired his work. And you know, Paul is so brilliant, so incredible. And as we look at people in our lives, whether it's your parents or Paul or Clayton, who give us these roadmaps for loving the world better and loving ourselves better, what is it about? Can you share some of the qualities of why someone like a Paul Alstrom, you've you've put so many eggs in this basket of following him as a leader and, and partnering with him in business and choosing him as a mentor. What were the characteristics or things that made you love him and admire him and and, and choose uh, that path? I'd love to know because I think we learn a lot about people about who they follow. And I know who you ultimately follow, which is the Lord. <laughs> but but I mean what is it about what is it about your friend Paul that has been um, such a gift to you? I think I think the um, Jesus parallel is an interesting way to answer this question. That is, with Jesus, who we love and admire, he's he's he was without error, right? He wasn't a finished product. Um, um, like he he came to Earth and he he wasn't he we wouldn't his body wasn't perfected yet, but he was without error, and he is our example, and he's amazing. Um, and uh, and he had he had to come and do what he had to do to to gain the power that he gained um, to help each of us. Um, and he had to he had to uh, perform the atonement, and uh, and that's awesome. And um, and so, but with everybody else, all of our other mentor options are deeply flawed people. Um, and so, you only we only have deeply flawed um, options. And so amongst the deeply flawed options, like, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I just got lucky. Paul really picked me. He hired me, but I guess I, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, doing stuff with him, but um, he, uh, Paul, I would say is like an extreme altruist. So characteristic of extreme altruists is they're willing to make great personal sacrifice in order to make a large impact in the world. And uh, he embodied he embodies that so he he could he could be worth you know he the man is independently wealthy has plenty of money but he could be worth 10 times more than he is now if he'd have pursued money but 
he he really pursued impact um once he made money and uh, i really looked up to that so that's that's what i've aspired to do as well um and uh he is wildly creative while i mean it's just fun to watch because i'm a very linear thinker it's like if we wanted to get to c just add a and b and we'll get to c and he's he he thinks kind of spherically walking around problems and and uh approaching things in very counter uh intuitive ways in very creative ways so anyway that's that's what i i've loved hanging out with him um he's uh uh, he's a wonderful consecrated man dedicated to to doing good and um there's no amount of personal sacrifice money or otherwise that he's not willing to make if he if he feels like that's what he's he's called to do so um, wow we're so lucky to have guy. we're so lucky to have people like that in the world and around us and in our communities and then what gifts what gifts they bring and how fun is it that we all have different gifts you know i was thinking about you said i'm, li- I'm a linear thinker and he's a, thinks more in spheres like i've learned so much in business from people that think or differently than me or choose differently than me and sometimes it's been a painful lesson of like the tension that i'm trying because i i spent so much of my life trying to understand people understand because i feel that in understanding them we can be closer because i have this deep value of I want to be fully known and chosen and I want people around me to be fully known and chosen by me. You know, this, this deep intimacy um, is so important to me. And so, so much of my energy and time goes into trying to understand like, and recently the paradox and all that energy I'm realizing is, um, I was just talking about this with my my sister-in-law through through Instagram as of we were just talking about this this morning. But in as i grow and i'm evolving the nuance in that is that there's just some things i'm not going to be able to understand and that's okay and i can just hold people in the totality of what they have to offer and i can be okay to be misunderstood and that those are those are incredible gifts as well to say i am misunderstand i'm probably i am misunderstanding i will misunderstand i will not be able to get context and vantage point from this person because i don't have their lived experience we are ultimately the amalgamation of all of our experiences and I can't, I can't make that chasm, that leap, and that's okay. But I can absolutely lead with love. So I may not understand, but I can, but I can, I can hold space with love. And those are such profound nuances. As you've, um, you know, worked in business, do you have any thoughts or ideas about uh, how to best do that, or, or is there any? Is that bring up anything for you as I talk about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. It's a great question. I I feel like I learned those lessons over and over again. Part of my <laughs> my uh, deep flaws is uh, is um, you know uh, I often find myself in in uh, working in small teams, and if I get too excited about my own ideas and don't hold space for people and allow other people to contribute and and be part of the decision making process inevitably you know people don't like doing that for long periods of time and and <laughs> uh they want to dissipate in the process so it it just is so important to um in business with your team uh to incorporate uh everybody's um everybody's ideas and, and make everybody part of the process and uh we are all children of god and he you know everybody has an as a need to create and to um to use their their intellect and it's it's so important to do that sometimes on my uh on my arrogant days i uh i have all the right answers and i really good at telling everybody what we need to get, what we need to do so yeah it's it's important thing i don't think that's a a good definition of leading with love so um i saw this really cool uh little little comment by steve Steve Jobs recently that I I tweeted it out recently if anybody wants to check it out but um he uh he just talked about you know uh the important part of building a company is figuring out what to do he said during a during a year uh you know there's there's a brain trust uh, at a, there was a brain trust at 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 the company he was at the time I think it was Next Computer and they had about 25 things they needed to make decisions on that everybody needed to weigh in on he said doing the things is uh, wasn't as important as knowing what things to do 
He said they could hire the world's best people to do almost anything they wanted, but uh, understanding the right things to do and getting all of the uh, the brain trust to weigh in on that was so important. And uh, it's a really cool concept, very much probably not even parallel, but like the exact same concept of councils um, from our church. Um, and uh, and it's a very powerful concept, but I think, you know, I, in his, I don't know how good I am at implementing it, but I do have a strong belief um, that getting everybody, all the stakeholders around the table to to find a consensus um, is the is the best way forward. I love the phrase: "If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together." So, that's, yeah, that's really good. And and I think there's um, there's a there's an energy and alchemy in sometimes out of love being differential and being like, we'll do it your way this time, even though I think my way's better and then you end up, I'd be right. And then you don't need to rub it in anyone's ro- nose or anything because we'll learn this together. You know, like I'm, I'm curious, I'm open and you're feeling, you're feeling needed, valued, seen contri- contribution. The relationship might dictate that we sometimes do things, you know, I've seen leaders do that at times. They're like, Let's 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 hurry up and break the thing, even though I know what's going to be, because you're going to learn this powerful lesson. And then we'll be together, you know, going or whatever. There's amazing nuances to all this that love just dictates. Sometimes hard actions, sometimes you know, saying hard things to people, sometimes allowing for failure, sometimes. I mean, it's just such a personal and intimate journey. The relationship that that love will render in in every expression, not just with God, but with each other and in our work. So, speaking yep. of a relationship with God you know, the work that you're doing in Angel Studios. Let's talk a little bit about that. So we're all, you and I are big fans of entertainment and you and I love people and storytelling and connecting and um, books and, and we're, you know, our culture is predicated by the stories that we tell ourselves. And I believe that we need to cultivate a community of compassion and a culture of compassion more than ever. And I think that um, right now, you know, we're seeing a lot of content that is not serving, you know, a lot of people in society, stuff that just feels um, divisive, debased, gratuitous, you know, I mean, it's kind of disappointing sometimes. And then every now and then a show comes on and I'm just like, this, oh my gosh, this is gold. This is like good fruit. Like I need more of this. How do we get more of this? And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about Hiram Brothers, Angel, everything you're doing for your day job. It's so exciting. And I'd love for you to share all of your perspective on it. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the question is why, why would I, why would I be involved in angel studios when it, it's a little bit of a shift from what I've done? I my you know, I've gone operational a couple of times, once at Roll mobile, once at, uh, um, Juxta labs where I helped help create the, the mapping app. Um, and, uh, but now I'm I'm pretty focused on the Angel Studios ecosystem, and uh, the you know the answer to that question is um, the Harmon brothers are the most powerful team we invested in, and so if you look at Vspring and in and, and Alta Ventures and other other deals and other vehicles we've participated in, I've been involved in in helping to invest in around a hundred startups, so. Um, in five years so we we get these farm boys from from burley right and uh i know farm boys from burley because that's that's who i wrestled and played football against growing up and i knew they would work like crazy so they 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 ended up really blowing our minds so in five years they did vid angel which you know um is still around will do have its biggest year this year around 15 million in sales they did the harmer brothers marketing agency which is created long form viral video marketing, which has done 8 billion views and hundreds of millions in sales for their clients. They created, um, Jordan created Cove, which was direct to consumer home security that he took to a hundred million dollar valuation. They did uh, dry bar comedy, um, which has 4 billion views. They co-created the chosen, um, which has 500 million views and 200 million in revenue. And then this summer they reinvented theatrical distribution. Like literally, the the movie studios are calling Angel to to distribute their films now. Um, and 
they do it in such a much much more efficient way um so that's six major kind of world disruptions in five years that's almost as much innovation as our other 99 teams put together so just wow. incredibly powerful team uh when they asked me to help run their internal venture fund i was like heck yeah um so you know it's just so much more important who you work with and what you do i think so but um yeah so that's why i'm i'm here i'm i'm uh it's you know i love love angel studios i love the leaders of angel studios and um love the opportunity to participate in uh in helping the mission which is to amplify light so um it is to it's a response to dark and nihilistic content that rarely finds itself in in hollywood i remember in the first pitch deck of vidangel one of the the slides that really sold me demonstrated that the the vast majority of content that gets created in 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 hollywood is rated r but most of the revenue comes from g to pg-13 and why why would that be your market um it it exists like that where the the revenue opportunity is is almost ignored and so it was a it was an op- awesome opportunity to to take care of some uh, or to to go after some latent value um while also doing good so that was super inspiring and uh, and they're still on that mission um 10 years later and so my my role is the managing director of the angel acceleration fund so it's the internal subsidiary that funds uh the best of the new angel studios pipeline and uh, so that's my role and, um and uh, it's super fun to to uh to operate from from this area and to, to help push forward this mission amazing and for those uh listeners that have heard of the Harmon brothers and those who haven't you've probably seen their long form infomercials that he that rob was referring to so like squatty potty and poopery and purple mattress and Kodiak cakes and like all of these um, commercials and they've taken, I think it was six companies to unicorn status with their marketing. Um, you know, these guys are like online marketing wizards is the, what I always say. So they, they've really disrupted, like you said, so many different industries. What is it about the angel model that has been so disruptive? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why it's been so successful? What are the different tools yep. or mechanisms or methodologies? What's their secret sauce of, of how they're doing it differently? Yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple of core innovations I think that are driving a lot of the value. And um, uh, so, number one, they're community focused. So, um, their goal is to help every filmmaker that they partner with have a huge online community that wants to become part of the franchise. So, um, that's that's number one. Um, number two is free. You can watch even in the theaters almost every piece of angel content for free um and the free model is wild right like even you can go get free tickets for the movie but then uh people are so passionate about the movie that a lot of people who click on the free tickets end up buying their own tickets and buying even more free tickets for people so that's really cool and everything on the app is free so how the heck do they make money so they they have four or five proprietary angel studios ways of making money um which is driving like 10 times more revenue on a comparable show than than normal Hollywood than normal Hollywood revenue streams. It's pretty cool. Everything from the pay up forward model to customized merchandise um uh you know uh plans to um to better theatrical distribution than 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 any other studio can provide. Um so free uh community oriented um Another major uh, innovation is the business model. So Hollywood has, you may have heard Hollywood has funny accounting. So most, the vast, vast majority of Hollywood films never have a back end. Our Hollywood veteran attorney says he can count on like one hand the number of back ends he's ever seen paid out. So Hollywood economics are all about uh, filmmakers growing their, bu- their, their production budgets as big as they can so they can take big upfront fees and studios making money and then equity holders the friends family and fools the lawyers and doctors losing their shirts on the on kind of the the production budgets um and so uh angel has flipped that on its head and said uh how about we always have a back end nobody makes any money until there's a profit 
So Angel takes all the, as the exclusive distributor of, of their content, they take all the hard costs off the top and pay those back. And then as profits flow to the bottom line, um, we see, uh, you know, Angel gets a third of those profits and the filmmakers get two thirds. So if you can pull off like 10% of a chosen, you can make like 10 million bucks. If you can pull off half a chosen, you make $50 million. This is way more money um, than filmmakers typically uh, believe they're going to make. And so it's, it's just, a, it's a very, it's a very attractive model. So they've basically just taken the film distribution industry and are, are kind of disrupting it level by level throughout the stack. So it's fun, fun stuff. I love it. What, one of the things that really struck me that resonated with me was the fact that there's this feedback loop that Hollywood doesn't have right now. If you were to take a show, and in fact, I'm a budding filmmaker. I had my exec, executive producer debut my my film on charitables and theaters i'm actually in the middle of executive producing a film right now starring just Alba and, and in conjunction with matt damon and ben affleck which is super fun called flash before the bang and as we're making this film you know we are having to pitch it to a, a, a lead group of people saying we think this is going to be a success right both of these films we had to just get in front of whether it's distributors or investors or whatever in the case of Angel, what I love, and the next documentary that I'm doing, I'm going to run through the Angel process, which I'm really excited for, um, is that you can ask if the dog wants to eat the dog food, so to speak. You can actually test these assumptions if the audience even wants to see it, if it's something, if you have something compelling, if the story is something people want to do. So it's kind of the lean startup model in tech. You can create an MVP, if you will, and then test these assumptions, which is so powerful and not be not been done historically. So. We make these torches and then you show this 10 minute production piece it's not a it's not a sizzle or a or a trailer but rather like an actual chunk of what the production would be like and i've been learning more about this because i was like what exactly is the torch and i even took some staffs and they're like no that's not quite it so i'm learning more they really want to showcase this is exactly what it'd be like and see if the audience they run it through like a hundred thousand people in a thing called the guild and then those people give feedback seventy thousand. so the, the guild number is going like yeah. like this right now wow um it's uh it's yeah it's probably um i was quite remiss in not mentioning that it's probably the most powerful uh unfair advantage that that angel has and that is it's 170 thousand super fans that that green light everything we do so it's this powerful focus group and this feedback loop and so now you're not you're seeing if people you know you might have a creative idea that you want to watch or like but then the world gets to tell you, no, we don't, at least the out audience. And it's kind of cool because um, I think that's the future of entertainment is like the ability for people to find out, do you actually want to, do you want to see this? Do you want to be a part of this before they go and make all this money, invest all this? I mean, people will spend just absurd amounts of money in production and film and development for it to be a total flop. I, I, under, I heard the statistic that only 20% of Hollywood films actually are profitable. Like that's just really bad odds yeah it is really bad odds and and if you're you're you know you're really smart lens like i i have no idea why any film with the with the advent of the angel guild i have no idea why any filmmaker would do anything but make a ton of kind of short torches test them and then follow the winners right and uh, yeah. it's just such a better model it's such a better uh return model for your for your investors um and you'll get a lot more famous a lot more rich and may have a lot more impact by by doing that and knowing what uh, knowing what people want so it, it makes it's kind of dumb smart it makes a lot of sense um but tell me a little bit like uh about the venture capital fund i mean i, I mean i know about it being an advisor but share with our audience why we built the fund to then match those projects that get through the guild and that are going through the crowdfunding process which is again proprietary and exciting and cool i mean they raised seventy million dollars or something for the first season of of the Chosen. Is that right? Just absurd amounts of crowdfunding came. Is that right? Yeah, it was it was it was quite a bit less than that, but yeah, it was ten million dollars. So okay, okay, the first um, season million dollars, but yeah, but it's I mean I've again I've been involved in a hundred tech deals, and I thought tech was expensive. Media is crazy. So crazy. Um, it, the the model that we have where you know it's all about the back end does bring budgets down so it aligns filmmakers with us and we'll have the we'll have filmmakers come in and be like 
yeah, I need 20 million for this, this, this TV season. Um, and then we tell them the model and they're like, yeah, I could probably do it for seven. So um, we are doing things for much, much less expensive than Hollywood budgets. Like the shift comes out tomorrow, it's a six and a half million dollar budget film, but it's comparable to a $20 million film out of Hollywood. So that's got the production value and, and cast and everything of that level. Um, but uh, despite the fact that we are able to do things much more efficiently, it's still so expensive. You know, mil- no. the mi- that's that's called our minimum film, right? So uh, we need to, you know, we're, we're competing against billions of dollars in investment at Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. Um, yeah. And so we need, we need tens of millions of dollars um, and yes. it's just, it's just a ton of capital. So um, it's fun though, because as a subsidiary of Angel, we have a huge unfair advantage where we get that guild data and we can invest in the best subset of, of the films coming through the Angel pipeline. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun place to be with a, with a cool, uh, with a cool, strong advantage. And we get to follow those winners, like you said, which is really exciting. And the returns of or have just been very compelling. I mean, um, The Sound of Freedom, which was released July 4th, and I know there's some controversy around, you know, the subject matter and everything, um, rightfully so, and all those things are coming to the surface. However, regardless of that, the distribution model that we're talking about in Angel has been so successful and that it it grossed more than Mission Impossible and... Um, and uh, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, yeah, that, that weekend, it was just crazy. Um, and that's why it's gotten all of Hollywood's attention. It's like, oh, they've got something. And one of the things I realized is the data, because of the feedback loop from the crowdfunding, we can then have these heat maps and know where to do distribution. I mean, this is just brilliant stuff. So there's so much excitement around where this is headed. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's so compelling. And the other the other piece that I really love, you talked about the customized merchandise revenue opportunity. And in the end, I mean, the Chosen did 200, it's done 200 million in revenue, is that right? In total, over three that's right. seasons, over, over two hundred million in revenue. Yeah, it, and that's three seasons. Is that right? That's right. Through the third season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just insane. Probably ten times the amount of money they would have anticipated otherwise. So it's yeah, a, it's an extremely powerful model. Remarkable. I love the chosen. By the way, so it's such the, cho- the chosen thing on the chosen's on Netflix. The chosen can be rented on Amazon. Uh, you can watch Chosen on a Delta flight, but all of that kind of traditional Hollywood revenue stream, stream makes up about 5% of Chosen revenue. So it's uh, I mean, angel models. Very yeah. Powerful. yeah, totally. And so I, you know, I find that really, really compelling and, and cool. And I love that show. My gosh, I'm so grateful for, for that show in my life. It's blessed my life significantly. Um, one of the things that I that I just wanted to kind of point out too was and have you maybe speak to a little bit is also like a proximity to transaction that you wouldn't get in the in the entertainment industry as well. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? That the creatives can have yeah. access to the audience. Yeah, I mean, and uh, you're going to see some innovations in the next few months that are going to make that even more powerful. So, um, but Angel is using data and proximity to transaction, unlike yeah, unlike any other. Um, unlike any other studio um one of the i think one of the easy ones to to understand and identify is the the theatrical pay it forward model so um people get done watching a film they're moved by the film and then a qr code pops up with a uh cause driven uh invitation to help 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 push that message farther and people can purchase message uh purchase tickets for other people to see the film in that very moment so um yeah, it's just uh, uh, cutting out lots and lots of middlemen and and and, and going direct. So it's it's uh, it's powerful. That's awesome. So there's just the sky is the potential for this, and you're at the helm of the of the venture capital fund and and, and a shareholder in the actual studio itself, which is so exciting, Rob. And thanks for letting me be a part of it all. Um, is there anything you want to share with the audience about kind of wrapping up this last I question? Want to share- of like how they can get involved or how they could connect with you or if they want to learn more. I would say, investing I would or, say number yeah. number one, if you get Lindsay involved in your in your in your in your project, she's been kind about her words about me, but she has the the uh, golden retriever energy. So I appreciate all you've done to help us, Linz. And uh you it's uh wild the the volume of um yeah you you actually have uh 
produce as many uh as much kind of business development for us as as all my other advisors combined so that's oh, been wow. awesome so while you're done Thanks, um yeah no and, um i i mean uh you know i don't never want to um we're a, we're a venture capital fund and we we um um yeah we do not uh kind of generally solicit or those kind of things but um but I would just say anybody who wants, who's interested in helping us take on Hollywood, there's there's uh, dozens of jobs on the website. Mm-hmm. Um, there is lots of partnerships to be had between organizations, and if anybody's interested, that kind of thing, um, don't has reach out. So yeah, um, Rob McMillan at Angel dot com is an easy way to to contact me and talk about partnering in uh, any ways you want to talk about. Amazing. And there's also, um, creatives can also approach the guild and submit to content. There's, there's so much potential to be involved with any of the mission of angel of amplifying light. Yeah. You know? and, and things are going to get more efficient. Um, whenever there's a new, I, I remember when Instagram influencing came out, this reminds me of those days, like Instagram influencing today sounds so cliche, <laughs> but in 20, 20- well, when it first came out, it was it blew people's minds. It flipped companies to to cash flow positive in our pot in our in our portfolio almost instantly. And people said, "Yeah, but everybody's going to figure that out." And uh, um, and it'll it won't always work like that. And today, it's much more efficient. And you know, the prices have gone up, and and you can't you know you can't get two cent installs on mobile apps and that kind of thing out of it anymore. But there was a three to five year period. Um, where you could like it wasn't like six months it wasn't like two months it wasn't like 30 days it took and so i think there there's an early period here for filmmakers where the angel studios where um you'll be able to get wild outcomes for your movies um and you'll be able to compete against anybody in hollywood um and uh if you, you know as by being an early kind of an early adopter very so, cool um well, it'll it'll eventually take over the whole industry, and, it, and everybody will be doing it, and and, all, and and we'll have to keep innovating like any good, yeah, like good, good innovation company. But that's an uh, those that are, that are early adopters and adopt the model now. I think have a have a good. Uh, there 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 are rents to be had in <laughs> arbitrage to be had by by participating early. I love it. Well, Rob, thank you for coming on my show and for being my golden retriever buddy. Oh, we should definitely go fishing at my ranch. I need to do that with you. I'm ready. Okay. Okay, guys. The number one thing I want out of uh, Lindsay's listeners is the following. If everybody could comment at the bottom of this podcast <laughs> to ask the Smoot family to let Rob bow hunt on the Smoot <laughs> ranch because of his big, huge heart and love for Lindsay and, and all you tell in general, that's what I'd like. So please comment in the bottom. Lindsay, please let Rob Bohan on your ranch. That's, a, that's the one thing I actually want out of this podcast. You're the best. I you, I know you've been awesome. Well, de- let's start with fishing. I don't know that we they allow hunting up there, but we'll do it. I hate our fish. I, I just like to catch fish. That's right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rob. You're the best. I'm so appreciate. Love you, man. Do you need help with the next steps for your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, estate attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call to schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at www.capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube.